Hi folks, uh, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to see you. I've been doing some research uh, recently on evolution and I want to give you some information that will uh, shock you concerning evolution. This is in page 241 of James Perloff uh, Tornado in a Junkyard 1999. He says, the evolutionary establishment fears creation science because evolution itself crumbles when challenged, challenged by evidence. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of public debates was arranged between evolutionary scientists and creationist scientists. The latest scored resounding victories with, with the result of that today, few evolutionists will debate. Isaac Asimov, Stephen Jay Gould and the late Carl Sagan, while highly critical of creationism, all declined to debate. The next piece of information is by Michael Denton, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, 1985, page 67, Australian molecular biologist. It was because Darwinian theory broke man's link with God and set him adrift in a cosmos without purpose or end that its impact was so fundamental. No other intellectual revolution in modern times so profoundly affected the way men viewed themselves and their place in the universe. Norman Macbeth Darwin retired, uh, page 71, uh, 1971, page 147. Unfortunately, in the field of evolution, most explanations are not good. As a matter of fact, they are hardly qualifying explanations at all. They are suggestions, hunches, pipe dreams, hardly worthy of being called hypotheses. Um, Tom Bethel, agnostic evolutionist, Harper's February 1985, page 61. No one has ever found an organism that is known not to have parents or a parent. This is the strongest evidence on behalf of evolution. Charles Darwin, 1866, quoted in H. Enoch, Evolution or Creation, page 197. As by this theory, innumerable transitional forms must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in the crust of the earth? Why is it not all nature in confusion instead of being? As we see them, well-defined species. Scientists have no proof that life was not the result of an act of creation. Robert Astro, The Enchanted Loom, Mind in the Universe, 1981, page 19, leading astronomer. Evolution became, in a sense, a scientific religion. Almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit in with it. H. Lipson, a physicist, looks at evolution. Physics Bulletin 3198, page 138. So that's, um, that's just a, a few bits of information there and we've got more information to come. Just let's think about it. Let's just think about evolution, how it started. They call it abiogenesis, but just just think about this. Nothing plus nothing equals two elements plus time equals 92 natural elements plus time equals all physical laws and a complete structured universe of galaxies, systems, stars, planets and moons orbiting in perfect balance and order. Think about that. Just think about it. Nothing plus nothing equals two elements plus time equals 92 nat natural elements plus time or physical laws a completely structured universe of galaxies, systems, stars, planets and moons orbiting perfect balance and order. Is that rational? Is that really, really rational?
Is it really, really rational, folks? Here's a thought. Those who laid the foundation of science in the 1800s, many of them were creationists. William Paley, 1743 1805, in his 1802 classic Natural Theology, said this. The kind of carefully designed structures we see in the living world point clear designer. I honestly don't think that anyone has ever equaled that in brilliance. Fred Hoyle, um, an eminent scholar, said that Paley's argument wouldn't appears unanswerable. Um, there was scientific information before Darwin that actually disproved Darwinian evolution. Carl Lin Carlos Linnaeus, 1707-1778, was a scientist who classified immense numbers of living organisms. An earnest creationist, he clearly saw that there were no halfway species, all plant and animal species with definite categories separate from one another. Variation was possible within the species, and there were many subspecies, but there were no crossovers from the species to another. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 7-6. The first law of thermodynamics, 1847. Heinrich von Helmont stated the law of conservation of energy. Some thought of all matter will always remain the same. This law refutes several aspects of evolutionary theory. Isaac Asimov calls it the most fundamental generalization about the universe that scientists have ever been able to make. Isaac Asimov, in the game of energy and thermodynamics, you can't even break even. Journal of Simothonian Institute, June 1970, page 6. The second law of thermodynamics, 1850, J.R.J.E. Close stated the law of entropy. All systems will tend towards the most mathematically probable state and eventually become totally random and disorganized. Harold Blum, Times, Arrow and Evolution, 1968, page 201. In other words, everything runs down, wears out, and goes to pieces. R. R. Kinsey, Physics, to what extent is it deterministic? American Scientist, uh, 56, 1968, page 100. This law totally eliminates the basic evolutionary theory that simple evolves into complex. Einstein said that two laws were the most enduring laws he knew, knew of. Jeremy uh, Rifkin, Entropy, A New Worldview, 1980, page 6. God, a loved woman, found 1812. This is a well-authenticated discovery which has been British Museum for over a century. A fully modern human skeleton was found in the French Caribbean island of Guadeloupe inside an immense slab of limestone dated by modern geologist at 28 million years old more examples could be cited human beings just like those living today but sometimes larger have been found in very deep levels of strata Ooh you did tell us that evolutionist Gregor Mendel 1822 1844 1884 was a creationist who lived and worked near Bron now Bruno Czechoslovakia he was a science a math teacher, unlike the theorist, Mendel was a true scientist. He bred garden peas and studied the results across various varieties. Beginning his work in 1856, he, 56, he concluded within eight years. In 1865, he reported his research in the Journal of Brun Society for the study of natural science. 
The journal was distributed to 120 libraries in Europe, England and America, yet its research was totally ignored by the scientific community until it was rediscovered in 1900. R.A. Fisher has Mendel's work been rediscovered and Annals of Science, Volume 1, Number 2, 1936. His experiments clearly showed that one species could not transmute into another one. A genetic barrier existed that could not be bridged. Mendel's work laid the basis for modern genetics and his discoveries effectively destroyed the basis of species evolution. Michael Pittman, Adam and Evolution, 1984, page 6364. Louis Pasteur, 1822, 1895, was another genuine scientist in the process of studying fermentation. He performed his famous 1861 experiment in which he disproved the theory of spontaneous generation. Life cannot arise from non-living material. This experiment was very important for up to that time a majority of scientists believed in spontaneous generation. They thought that if a pile of old claws were left in a corner it would breed mice. The proof was that upon later returning to the claws mice would frequently be found there. Pasteur concluded from his experiment that only God could create living creatures but modern evolutionary theory continues to be based on that outdated theory disproved by Pasteur. Spontaneous generation Life arises from non-life, why? Because it is the only basis on which evolution could occur. As Adams notes, with spontaneous generation discredited by Pasteur, biologists were left with no theory of the origin of life at all. J. Edison Adams, Plants and Introduction to Modern Biology, 1967, uh, to page 585. Augustus Frederick Leopold Wiseman, 1834 to 1914, was a German biologist who disproved Lambert notion of inheritance acquired characteristics. He's primarily remembered as a scientist. Sorry about that. Augustus Frederick Leopold Wiseman, 1834 to 1914, was a German biologist who disproved Lamarck's notion of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. He is primarily remembered as the scientist who cut off the tails of 901 young white mice in 19 successive generations, yet each new generation was born with a full length tail. The final generation, he reported, had tails as long as those originally measured on the first. Wiseman also carried out other experiments that buttressed his refutation of Lamarckism, his discoveries, along with the fact that circumcision of Jewish males for 4,000 years had not, not affected the foreskin. Kept stretching the next, which is so their necks. Yet Lamarckism continues today uh, as the disguised basis of evolutionary biology. For example, ev evolutionists still teach that giraffes kept stretching their necks to reach higher branches so their necks became longer. In a later book, Darwin abandoned natural selection as unworkable and returned to Lamarckism as the cause of the never observed change from the species to another. Randall Hett, The Secret of the Sixth Edition, 1984. Here is a brief partial overview of that true scientists were accomplishing in the 18th, 19th centuries. All of them were creationists. Louis Agassiz, Agassiz 1807-1873, Glacial Geology. Charles Babbage, 1792-18. Brewster, 1781, 1868, Optical Mineralogy, Kaleidoscope, George Curvier, 1769 to 1837, 32, Comparative Anatomy, Vertebrate Paleontology, Sir Humphrey Davy, 1778, 1829, the, uh, Thermal Kinetics, Jean Henry Fiber, 1823-1915, Entomology of Living Insects, Michael Faraday, 1791-1867, Electric Generator, Electric Magnetic Field Theory, John 
Sir John A. Fleming, 1849-1945, electronics thermic valve. John Henry, 1797-1878, electric motor galvanometer. Sir William Herschel, 1738-1822, galactic astro astronomy double stars. James Jewell, 1818-1889, reversible thermodynamics. Lord William Kelvin, 1824-1907, absolute temperature scale, energetics, thermodynamics, transatlantic cable. Johannes Kepler, 1571-1630, classical mechanics, inferior tables, physical astronomy. Carlos Linnaeus, 1707-1778, classification system, systematic biology. Joseph Listus, 1827-1912, antiseptic surgery. Matthew Murray, 1806. 1873 hydrography oceanography James C Maxwell 1831-1879 electrical dynamics statistical thermodynamics George Mendel 1822-1884 genetics Samuel B Moore 1791-1872 telegraph Isaac Newton 1642-1727 calculus dynamics law of gravity reflecting telescopes Blaise Pascal 1623-1662 hydrostatistics Barometer Louis Pasteur 22 1895 bacteriology biogenesis law pasteurization vaccination and immunization Sir William Manzi 1852 1916 inert gases instropatic chemistry John Ray 1827 1704 natural history classification of plants and animals John Riley 1842 1919 dimensional analysis model analysis Bernard Rim Raymond 1826-1866 non-elution geometry Sir James Simpson 1811-1870 chloroform gynecology Sir George Storks 1819-1903 fluid mechanics and Rudolf uh, Verco 1821-1902 pathology So what we've seen here is massive, absolute massive crea creationist scientists um, doing amazing scientific work. A number of those scientists completely giving us information that completely debunks evolution and yet the evolutionists continue to go on their merry way ignoring all these formidable scientists. Uh, so now let's go to these evolutionists and you'll find many of these evolutionists were actually not uh, the kind of scientists that I've just mentioned. They didn't have the same caliber, they didn't have the same ability uh, who then developed uh, evolution. So let's just look at this. Emanuel Swedenberg in 1688 and 1772 was a do-nothing expert. In his 1734 book, Principia, he theorized that a rapidly rotating nebula formed itself into a solar system of sun and planets. He claimed he obtained the idea from spirits during a seance. It is significant that the nebula hypothesis theory originated from such a source. Comet de Buffon, 1707-1788, was a desolate philosopher who enabled to improve the work of Linnaeus spent his time criticizing him. He theorized that species, species originated from one another and that a chunk was torn out of the sun, which became our planet. As with other philosophers, he presented no evidence in support of his theories. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, 1744-1829, made a name for himself by theorizing. He accomplished little else of significance. He laid the foundation of modern evolutionary theory with his concept of inheritance of acquired characteristics, which was later given the name of Lamarckism. In 1809, he published a book, Philosophy Zulikik, in which he declared that the giraffe got its long neck by stretching it up to reach the higher branches. The birds that lived in water grew wet feet. According to that, if you pull hard on your feet, you will gradually increase their length, and if you decide in your mind to do so, you can grow hair and on your bald head, and your offspring will never be bald. This is science. Lamarck's other erroneous contribution to evolutionary was the theory of uniformitarianism, 
This is the conjecture that all area ages on the earth were exactly as they are today, calm and peaceful with no worldwide flood or other great catastrophes. Robert Chambers, 1802 to 1883, was a spiritualist who regularly communicated with the spirits. As a result of his contacts, he wrote the first popular evolution book in all of Britain called Vestities of Creation, 1844. It was printed 15 years before Darwin's book, Origin of Species. Charles Lyell, 1797 to 1875, like Charles Darwin, Lyell inherited great wealth and was able to spend his time theorizing. Lyell published his Principle of Geology in 1830 to 1833, and it became the basis for the modern theory of sed sedimentary strata, even though 20th century discoveries in radio dating and radiocarbon dating missing strata and overthrust older strata on top of more recent strata have nullified the theory. In order to prove this theory, Lyle was quite willing to misstate the facts. He learned that Niagara Falls had eroded a 7 mile L uh, 11 kilometer channel from Queenston to Ontario and that it was eroding at about 3 feet 1 uh, a year. So Lyle conveniently changed that to 1 foot 3 a year, in which meant that the fall had been flowing for 35,000 years. But Lyle had not told the truth. Three erosion a year at its present rate of flow would only take us back 700 to 9,000 years, and it would be expected that just after the flood, the flow would for a time have greatly increased the erosion rate. Lyle was a close friend of Darwin and urged him to write his book, Origin of Species. Alfred Russell Wallace in 1823-1913 is considered to be the man who developed the theory which Darwin published. Wallace was deeply involved in spiritism at the time he formulated the theory in this turn at paper which Darwin, with the help of two friends, Charles Lyle and Joseph Hooker, pirated and published under his own name. Darwin, a wealthy man, thus obtained the royalties which belonged to Wallace, a poverty-ridden theorist. In 1980, I'll read that again. Alfred Russell Wallace, 1823-1913, is considered to be the man who developed the theory which Darwin published. Wallace was deeply involved in spiritism at the time he formulated the theory in his turnip paper, which Darwin, with the help of two friends, Charles Lyle and Joseph Hooker, pirated and published under his own name. Darwin, a wealthy man, thus obtained the royalties which belonged to Wallace, a poverty-ridden theorist. In 1980, Arnold C. Brackman, in his book, A Delicate Arrangement, established that Darwin plagiarized Wallace material. It was arranged that a paper by Darwin would be read to the Royal Society in London, while Wallace was held back until later. Priorities for the ideas thus Having been taken care of, Darwin set to work to prepare his book. In 1875, Wallace came out openly for Spiritism and Marxism, another stepchild of Darwinianism. This was Wallace's theory, species have changed in the past, by which one species descended from another in a manner that we cannot prove today. That is exactly what modern evolution teaches. It has no more evidence supporting the theory than Wallace had in 1858 when he devised the theory while in fever. February 1858, while in a delirious fever on the island of Ternate in the Molochas, Wallace conceived the idea of survival of the fittest as being the method by which species change, but the concept proves nothing. The fittest, which one is that? Is it the one that survived longest? Which one survived longest? The fittest, this is a reasoning in a circle. Freire says nothing about the evolutionary process, much less proving it. In the first edition of his book, Darwin regarded natural selection and survival of the fittest as different concepts. By the sixth edition of his Origin of the Species, he thought they meant the same thing, but that survival of the fittest was the more accurate. In still later book, Descent of Man, 1871, Darwin ultimately abandoned natural selection as a hopeless mechanism and returned to Lamarckism. Even Darwin recognized the theory was falling to pieces. The supporting evidence just was not there. Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882, was born into wealth and able to have a life of ease. He took two years of medical school at Edinburgh University and then dropped out. It was the only scientific training he ever received. Because he spent the time in bars and with friends, he barely passed his courses. Darwin had no particular purpose in life and his father planned to get him into a nicely paid job as an Anglican minister. Darwin did not object. 
but an influential relative got him a position as an unpaid naturalist on a ship planning to sail around the world, the Beagle. The voyage lasted from December 1831 to October 1836. It is of interest that, after engaging in spiritism, certain men in history have been seized with a deep hatred of God and have then been guided to devise evil teachings that have destroyed large numbers of people, while others have engaged in warfare which have annihilated millions. In connection with this, we think of such non spiritism as Sigmund Freud and Adolf Hitler. It is not commonly known that Charles Darwin, while an actress aboard the Beagle, was initiated into witchcraft in South America by nationals. During horseback travels into the interior, he took part in their ceremonies, and as a result, something happened to him. <coughs> Upon his return to England, although his health was strangely weakened, he spent the rest of his life working on theories to destroy faith <coughs> in the Creator. After leaving South America, Darwin was on the Galapagos Island for a few days. While there, he saw some finches which had blown in from South America <coughs> and adapted to their environment, producing several subspecies. He was certain that this showed cross-species evolution, changing to new species, but they were still finches. This theory about the finches was the primary evidence of evolution he brought back with him to England. <coughs> Darwin, never a scientist and knowing nothing about the particularities of genetics, then married his first cousin, which resulted in all seven of his children having civic, physical or mental disorders. One girl died after birth, another at ten. His oldest daughter had prolonged breakdown at fifteen. There of his children became semi-invalid and his last son was born mentally retarded and died nineteen months after his birth. His book Origin of Species was first published in November 1859, the full title of the, On the Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of the Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life reveals the viciousness of the underlying concept. This concept led directly to two of the worst wars in the history of mankind. In his book, Darwin reasoned from the theory to the facts and provided little evidence for what he had to say. Modern evolutionist is ashamed. would cite authorities that he did not mention. He repeatedly said it was only an abstract and a fuller edition would come out later, but although he wrote other books, try as he may, he never could find the proof for his theories, nor one since has found it either. When he did name an authority, it was just an opinion from a letter. Phrases indicating the hypothetical nature of this, his ideas were frequent. It might have been, maybe, probably, it is conceivable that a favourite of his was let a second imagery, imaginary example. Darwin would suggest a possibility and later refer back to it as a fact, as we have already demonstrated previously, etc. Elsewhere he would suggest a possible series of events, and then conclude by assuming that proved the point. He relied heavily on stories instead of facts. Confusing examples would be given, and he would use sp spacious and devious arguments and spent much time suggesting possible explanations. I'm in the strata. Later these changed species travelled over to the western world to be found in strata. There was new species, so species were changing on up the other side of the world and that was why species in the process of change were not found on the other side. We're thinking like this who need science, but remember that Charles Darwin never had a day of schooling in the sciences. Here is Darwin's explanation of how one species changed into another. It is a variation of Larmack's theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics. Nicholas Hutton, Third Evidence of Evolution, 1962, page 138, calling it pangenesis. Darwin said that an organ affected by the environment would respond by giving off particles that he called gemmules. These particles supposedly help determine hereditary characteristics. The environment would affect an organ, gemmules would drop out of the organ, and the gemmules would travel to the reproductive organs where they would affect the cells. W. Stanfield, Scientific Science of Evolution, 1977, page 38. 
As mentioned earlier, scientists today are ashamed of Darwin's ideas. In his book, Darwin taught, taught that man came from an ape and that the stronger races would, within a century or two, destroy the weaker ones. Modern evolutionists claim that man and ape descend from a common ancestor. After taking part in the witchcraft ceremonies, not only was his mind affected, but his body also. He developed a chronic and in incapacitating illness and went to his death under a depression he could not shake. Random House Encyclopedia, 1977, page 768. He frequently commentated in his private letters that he recognized there was no evidence for his theory and that it could destroy the morality of the human race. Long before the reader has arrived at this part of my work, a crowd of difficulties will have occurred to him. Some of them are so serious that to this day I can hardly reflect on them without in some degree becoming staggered. Charles Darwin, Origin of Species, 1860, page 178, quoted from Harvard Classics, 1909 edition, volume 11. Often a cold shudder has run through me and I have asked myself whether I may have not devoted myself to fantasy. Charles Darwin, Life and Letters, 1887, volume 2, page 229. The next uh, evolutionist um, that we're going to be looking at is um, is uh, Thomas Huxley, 1825, 18 to 1895, was the man Darwin called my bulldog. Darwin so, was so frail in health that he did not make public appearances, but he remained secluded in the mansion he inherited after being personally converted by Darwin on a visit to Darwin's home. Huxley championed the evolutionary cause with everything he had. In the later part of the 19th century, while Hale laboured earnestly on the European continent, Huxley was Darwin's primary advocate in England. The X Club was a secret society in London which works to further evolutionary thought and suppress scientific opposition to it. It was powerful for all scientific papers considered by the Royal Society had to be first approved by this small group of nine members. Chaired by Huxley, its members made contacts and powerful, effective British scientific associations. Michael Pittman, Adam and Evolution, 1984, page 64. Woo! You don't learn this in science class. But what do they do? Asked a curious journalist. They run British science, a professor replied. And on the whole, they don't do it badly. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 467. <laughs> That's amazing. In the 20th century, U.S. government agencies working closely with the National Science Federation and kindred organizations have channeled funds for research to universities willing to try and find evidence for evolution. Down to the present day, theorists are still trying to control the scientists. The Oxford debate was held in June 1860 at Oxford University, only seven months after the publication of Darwin's Origin of the Species, a special meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. It marked a major turning point in England, just as the 1925 Scorps trial would be the turning point in North America. Scientific facts had little to do with either event, both were just battles between personalities. In both instances, evolutionists won through ridicule. They dared not rely on scientific facts to support their case, because they had none. Samuel Wilberforce, Anglican Bishop of York, Oxford University, was scheduled to speak that evening in defense of creation. Huxley had lectured on behalf of evolution in many English cities and was not planning to attend that night. But Chambers, a spiritualist advisor to Huxley, was impressed to find and tell him he must attend. Wilberforce delivered a vigorous attack on evolution for half an hour before a packed audience of 700 people. His presentation was outstanding and the audience was apparently with him. But when Wilberforce turned and rhetorically asked Huxley a humorous question whether it was through his grandfather or his grandmother that Huxley claimed descent from an ape. Huxley was extremely sharp-witted and at the bishop's question he clasped the knee of the, per the person sitting next to him and said, he is delivered into my hands. Huxley arose, worked the audience up to a climax and then declared that he would feel no shame in having an ape as an ancestor but would be ashamed of a brilliant man who plunged into scientific questions of which he knew nothing. John W. Clot, Science and Religion in Studies and Creation, 1980. Five, page 4546. At this, the entire ring went wild, some yelling one thing and others another. 
On a pretext, so thin, the evolutionist in England became a power with scientists feared to oppose. We will learn that ridicule heaped on ridicule through the public press accomplished the same results for American evolutions in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. The Or Orgule Meteorite, 1861, was one of the many hoaxes perpetrated to further the cause of evolution. Someone inserted various dead microbes and then covered it over with a surface appearing like the meteorite. The object was to show that life came from outer space. But the hoax was later discovered, Scientific America, January 1965, page 52. A remarkable number of hoaxes have occurred since then. Men working desperately have tried to provide scientific evidence that does not exist. In the mid-1990s, a meteorite from Mars with a dead organism on it was trumpeted in the press, but ignored were the conclusions of competent scientists that discovered was highly, discovery was highly speculative. Sir Francis Galton, in 1822 to 1911, Galton was Charles Darwin's cousin who amplified on one of the theory's logical conclusions. He declared that the science of eugenics was the key to humanity's problems, put the weak, infirm and aged to sleep. Adolf Hitler, an ardent evolutionist, used it successfully in World War II. Otto Scott, playing God, in, in Calcedon Report, number 247, February 8, 1968, page 1. Wallace break with Darwin. Darwin's close friend, Russell Wallace, eventually separated from Darwin's position, a position he given Darwin when one realized that the human brain was far too advanced for an evolutionary process to have produced it. Lawrence C. Easley was Darwin wrong about the human brain, Harper's Magazine, 1955. Herbert Spencer, 1820-1903, along with certain other men, Frederick Nietzsche, Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud, John Dewey, introduced evolutionary modes and morality into social fields, social, sociology, psychology, education, welfare, economics, with devastating effects on the, 19, on the 20th century. Spencer, also a spiritist, was the one who initially invented the term evolution. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 159. Spencer introduced sociology into Europe, clothing it in evolution returns. From there it travelled to America. He urged that the unfit be eliminated so society could properly evolve. Harvey E. Barnes, Historical so Sociology, 1948 13. In later years, even the leading evolutionists of the time, such as Huckley and Darwin, became tired of the fact that Spencer could do nothing but theorise and knew so little of real life facts. The Archaeopatrix, 1861 to 1877. These consisted of several fossils from a single limestone quarry in Germany, each of which the quarry owner sold at high price. One appeared to possibly be a small dinosaur skeleton, complete with wings and feathers. European museums paid high prices for them as well, as we will learn below. In 1985, the, Arche the Archaeopatrix was shown to be a fake. Ernest Haeckel in 1834 to 1990, a teacher at the University of Jena in Germany, was the most zealous advocate of Darwinism on the continent in the 19th century. He drew a number of fraudulent charts, first published in 1868, which purported to show that embryos were almost identical to those of other animals. Reputable scientists reputed them a few years Within a few years, for embryologists recognized the deceit, see Chapter 16, Vestities and Recapitulation, and our website for the charts. Darwin and Haeckel had a strong influence on the rise of world communism. Daniel uh, Gesman, Scientific Origins of National Socialism, Social Darwinism in Ernest Haeckel and the German Mon Monist League, 1971. March Horde series, 1870, Othiel C. March claimed to have found 30 different kinds of horse fossils in Wyoming and Nebraska. He re reconstructed and arranged them in a small to large evolutionary series, which was never in a straight line, Encyclopedia Britannica, 1976, volume 7, page 13. Although displayed in museums for a time, the great majority of scientists labeled
later repudiated this whole scene. Charles Depper, Transformations of the Animal World, page 105. J. Edgar Cooke, Implications of Evolution, 1960, page 149. Frederick Nietzsche, 1844-1900. Nietzsche was a remarkable example of a man who fully adopted Darwinian principles. He wrote books declaring that the way to evolve was to have wars and kill the weaker races in order to produce a super race. T. Walter Wallbank, Alston, M. Taylor, Civilization, Civilization Past and Present, Volume 2, 1949, page 274. Darwin, in Origin of Species, also said that this needed to happen. The writings of both men were read by a German militarist and led to World War I. Hitler valued both Darwin's and Nietzsche's books. When Hitler killed six million Jews, he was only doing what Darwin taught. It is of interest that a year before he defended John Scott's right to teach Darwinianism, at the Dayton Monkey Trial, Clarence Darrow declared in court that the murderous thinking of two young men was by that, having learned Nietzsche's vicious Darwinism in the public schools, W. Brigham classified speeches. Asa Gray was the first leading theistic evolutionary advocate in America at the time when Darwin was writing in his books. Gray, a Presbyterian, worked closely with Charles W. Eliot, president of Harvard, in promoting evolutionist Christian teaching, yet teaching long ages and the book of Genesis as fable. The Challenger was a British ship dispatched to find evidence on the ocean bottom of, of evolutionary change during its 1872 to 1876 voyage. It carried on seafloor dragging but found no fossils developing on the bottom of the ocean. By this time it was obvious to evolutionists that no fossils were developing on either land or sea, yet they kept quiet about the matter. Over the years, theories, hoaxes, false claims, and ridiculous favoring evolution were spread abroad, but facts refuting it when found were kept hidden. Karl Marx, 1888, 1818, 1883, is closely linked with Darwinianism, that which Darwinian, Darwin did to biology, Marx, with the help of others, did to society. All the worst political philosophies of the 20th century emerged from the dark cave of Darwinianism. Mark was thrilled when he read Origins of Speeches and he immediately wrote Darwin and asked to dedicate his own major work, Dis Capital, to him. Darwin, in his reply, thanked him but said it would be best not to do so. In 1866, Karl Marx wrote to Frederick Engels the origin of the species contained the basis in natural history for the political and economic system for an atheist world. Engels, the co-founder of world communism with Marx and Lenin, wrote to Karl Marx in 1856, Darwin, who I am just now reading, is splendid. See Zirkel, Evolution, Marxian Biology and the Social Scene, 1959, page 85. In 1861, Mark to Engels, Darwin's book is very important and serves me as a basis in natural selection for the class struggle in history. At Mark's funeral, Engels said that as Darwin had discovered the law of organic evolution in natural history, so Marx had discovered the law of evolution in human history, Otto Ruth, Karl Marx, 1948, page 366. As Darwin emphasized competitive survival as the key to advancement, so communism focused on the value of labor rather than the, the laborer. Like Darwin, Karl Marx thought he had discovered the law of development. He saw history in stages as the Darwinians saw geological strata and successive forms of life. William Grant Summer, 1840-1910, applied evolutionary principles to political economics at Yale University. He taught many of America's future businesses and industrial leaders that strong business should succeed and the weak perish. Millionaires in the fittest modern less fair capitalism was the result. Gilman M. Ostroner, The Evolutionary Outlook, 1875, 1900, 1971, page 5. William James, 1842, 1910, was another evolutionist who influenced American thinking. His view of psychology placed the study of human behavior on an, an, an animalistic evolutionary basis. Tidal Hypothesis Theory, George Darwin, son of Charles Darwin, wanted to come up with something original, so he invented the theory that four million years ago the moon was pressed nearly against the earth, which resolved every five hours. 
Then one day a heavy tide occurred in the ocean which lifted it out of its present location. Later the proponents of George's theory decided that the Pacific Basin is the whole moon left behind when those large ocean waves pushed it out into space. Bumpus Sparrows, 1898. Herman Bumpus was a zoologist in Brown University during the winter of 1898. By accident, he carried out one of the only field experiments in natural selection. One cold morning, finding 136 stunned house sparrows on the ground, he tried to nurse them back to health. Of the total, 72 revived and 64 died. He weighed and carefully measured all of them and found that those closest to the average survived best. This frequently quoted research study is another evidence that the most animal or plant closest to the original species is the most hardy. Subspecies variations will not be as hardy. An evolutionary entirely cross species, if the DNA code would permit it, would therefore be to weaken to survive. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 6 1. Hugo de Veres, 1848 to 95 was a Dutch botanist and one of the three men who in 1900 rediscovered Mendel's paper on the law of heredity. One day while working with Primrose, de Vares thought he had discovered a new species. This made headlines, he actually had found a new variety, subspecies of Primrose, but de Vares conjectured that perhaps his new species had suddenly sprung into existence as a mutation. He theorized that new species saltated leaped, that is, continually spring into existence. His idea is called saltation theory. This was a new idea and during the first half of the 20th century many bi evolutionary biologists finding absolutely no evidence supporting natural selection switched from natural selection, Darwinism, to mutation, Neo-Darwinism, as the mechanism by which the theory cross-species changed occurred. Later in this book, we will discover that mutations cannot produce evolution either, for they are always harmful. In addition, decades of experimentation have revealed they never produce new species. In order to produce the, produce the mutation theory, the various and other research immediately began experimentation on fruit flies, and it has continued ever since, but totally without success in producing new species. Ironically, the various solitation theory was based on an observational error. In 1914, Edward Jeffries discovered that the various primrose was just a new variety, not a new species. Des decades later, it was discovered that most plant varieties were produced by variations in gene factors, rarely by mutations. Those caused by gene variations may be strong, although not as strong as the average original. But those varieties produced by mutations are always weak and have a poor survival rate. See chapter 10 mutations for much more on the mutation problem. Walter S. Sutton and T.V. Bovary independently discovered chromosomes and the linkage of genetic characters. This was only two years after Mendel's research was rediscovered. Scientists were continually learning new facts about the fixity of species. Thomas Hunt Morgan, 1886 to 1945, was an American biologist who developed the theory of the gene. He found that the genetic determinants were present in definite linear order in the chromosomes and could be somewhat mapped. He was the first to work intensively with the fruit fly, Dorsivola, Michael Pittman and Adam Evolution in 1984, page 70. But research within the fruit flies and other creatures has proved a total failure in showing mutation to be a mechanism for cross species change. Richard B. Goldschmidt, Evolution as Viewed by One Geneticist, American Scientist, January 1952, page 94. H.J. Muller, 1990-1967, upon learning of the 1927 discovery that X-rays, gamma rays and various chemicals could induce an extremely rapid increase of mutations in the chromosomes of test animals and plants, Muller pioneered in using X-rays to greatly increase the mutation rate in fruit flies. But all he and other researchers found was that mutation were always harmful. H.G. Muller, H. G. Muller 
Time, November 11, 1946, page 38. E.G. Gardner, Principles of Genetics, 1964, page 192. Theodosius W. Ansky, Genetics and the Origin of Species, page 1951, page 73. Sigmund Freud, 1856 to 1936, was deeply indebted to the evolutionary training he received in Germany as a man. He fully accepted it as well as Haeckel's recapitulation theory. Freud began his introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, 1916, within Haeckel's premise. Each individual somehow recapitulates in an abbreviated form the entire development of the human race. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 177. Freud's, uh, Freud's Oedipus complex was based on the theory of primal, primal horde. He developed about a mental complex that cavemen families had long ago. His theories of anxiety complex and oral and anal stages were based on his belief that our ancestors were savages. H.G. Wells, 1866 to 1946, the scientific pioneer, science fiction pioneer, Based his imaginative writing on ev evolutionary teachings, he had received a science training under Professor Thomas H. Huxley, Darwin's chief defender. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 1856 to 1930, like a variety of other evolutionary leaders before and after, was an avid spiritist. Many of his mystery stories were based on evolutionary themes. George Bernard Shaw, 1856 to 1950, was so deeply involved in evolutionary theory that he openly declared that he wrote his plays to teach various aspects of the theory. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, excuse me, page 461. Pit Down Man, 1912, 1912 parts of a jaw and skull were found in England and dubbed Pit Down Man. News of it created a sensation. Excuse me. The report of a dentist in 1916 who said someone had filled down the teeth, filed down the teeth was ignored, as we will learn below. In 1953, the fact that it was a total hoax was uncovered. This law And basically taught that there is no moral code, our ancestors were savage and civilization only progressed by violence against others. It therefore led to extreme nationalism, racism and warfare through nations, Nazism and fascism. Evolution was declared to involve natural selection and in the struggle to survive the fittest will win out at the expense of their rivals. Frederick von Bernhard a German military officer wrote a book in 1909 extolling evolution and appealing to Germany to start another war. Henrik von Trach, a Prussian militarist, loudly called for war by Germany in order to fulfill its evolutionary destiny. Henrik von Trach's Politics, Volume 1, page 6667. Their teachings were fully adopted by the German government and it only waited for a pretext to start the war. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 59. Young, The Darwin Debate in Marxism Today, volume 26, April 1982, page 21. Communist teaching declared that evolutionary change which taught class struggle came by a revolution and violent uprisings. Communist dogma declared that Lamarckism inheritance of acquired characteristics is the mechanism by which is, this is done. Mendelian genetics was officially outlawed in Russia in 1949 since it was recognized as disproving evolution. Communist theories also settled on synthetic speciation instead of natural selection or mutations as the mechanism for species change L.B. Halstead Museum of Errors in Nature November 20th 1980 page 208 this concept is identical to the sudden change theory of Goldschmidt and Gould which we all which we will mention later John Dewey 1859 to 1952 was another influential thought leader a vigorous Darwinist, Dewey founded and led out in the progressive education movement which so greatly affected US educational history. 
but it was nothing more than careful animal training. Samuel E. Blunfield, NEA Trojan Horse in American Education, 1984, page 43. The purpose was to indoctrinate the youth into evolution, humanism, and collectivism. In 1933, Dewey became a charter member of the American Humanist Association and its first president. In its basic statement, a belief published that year as the Humanist Manifesto became the unfolded framework of teaching in more schools and textbooks. The evolutionists recognized that they must gain control of all public education. Sir Julian Huxley quoted in Soul Tax and Charles Callender, Evolution After Darwin, three volumes, 1960. Historically, American education was based on morals and standards, but Dewey said that in order to be progressive, education must leave the past and evolve upward to new modern concepts. The Scott trial, July 10th to July 21st, 1925, was a powerful aid to the cause of evolution, yet scientific discoveries were not involved. That was fortunate, since except for a single tooth later disproved and a few other frauds, the evolutionists had nothing worthwhile to present. The world's most famous, the world's most famous court, court trial, a complete stenographic report, 1925. The ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, had been searching for someone they could use to test the Butter, the Butler Act which forbade the teaching of evolution in the public schools in Tennessee. John Scorps, 24 at the time, volunteered for the job. He later privately admitted that he had never actually taught evolution in class, so the case was based on a form. ...never dared oppose evolutionists. The entire trial, while reportedly as the Tennessee trial, monkey trial, Tennessee monkey trial was sorry, was the Scorch trial. Evolutionists turned the Dayton trial into a ridiculous circus in order to frighten later state governments into banning creation in their school curricula. Sorry about this. The Tennessee Monkey Trial was presented to the public as something of a comic opera. A trained ape was even sent in to walk around on chain on the streets of Dayton, but the objective was deadly serious and they succeeded very well. Ridicule, sides, issues, misinformation, and false statements were used to win the battle. Nebraska man debunked 1922-1928. In 1922, a single molar tooth was found and named Hespropethecus, or Nebraska man. An artist was told to make an eight-man picture based on the tooth, which went around the world. Nebraska man was a key evidence at the Scott trial in July 1925. The evolutionists had little else to offer. Grafton Smith, one of those involved in the publicizing Nebraska man, was knighted for his efforts in return to the site. In 1928, they found the rest of the skeleton and discovered the tooth belonged to an extinct pig. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 322. In 1972, living specimens of the same pig were found in Paraguay. George McCready Price, 1870 to 70. 1963 had a master's degree but not in science, yet he was the staunchest opponent of evolution in the first half of the 20th century. He produced 38 books and numerous articles to various journals. Price was the first person to carefully research into the accumulated findings of geologists and discovered that they had no evidence to support their claims about strata and fossils. Since his time, the situation has not changed. R. Milner, Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1990, page 194. Along with mutations, the study of fossils and strata ranks as the leading potential evidence supporting given evolutionary claims, but no transitional species have been found. Ancient species, aside from the extinct ones, 
were like those today except larger and strata are generally missing and at times switched with the younger strata below older because there is no fossil strata evidence supporting evolution. The museum Oliver Wendell Holmes, J.R., 1841 to 1935, powerfully affected the U.S. Supreme Court in both viewpoint and legal precedent. He was forceful in his position and a leading justice for 30 years. The prevalent view since his time is that law is a product of evolution and should continually evolve in accordance with the social policy. But this, of course, keeps taking America further and further from the U.S. Constitution. Vladimir Nikolai Lenin, 1870-1924, and Joseph Stalin, 1879-1953. Lenin was an ardent evolutionist who, in 1918, violently overthrew the Russian government and founded the Soviet Union. According to Yarotsky, a close friend of his, at an early age while attending a Christian Orthodox school, Stalin began to read Darwin and became an atheist. He your last key landmark in the life of Stalin, 1940, page 8, 9, and 9. Stalin was headed for the Soviet Union from 1824-1953. During these years, he was responsible for the death of millions of Russians who refused to yield to his slave state tactics. The Soviet Union under Stalin was an outstanding example of Darwinian principles extended to an entire nation. Austin H. Clark, 1880 to 1954, an ardent evolutionist, was one of the staff of the Simonian Institute from 1908 to 1950 and a member of several important scientific organizations. A prominent scientist, he authored several books and about 600 scientific articles. But after years of honesty trying to deal with the fact that there is no evidence for cross species change, in 1830 he wrote an astounding book, The New Evolution. Zoo Genesis, in it he cited facts after facts disproving the possibility that major types of plants and animals could have evolved from one another. The book was breathtaking and could not be answered by any evolutionist. His alternative pro proposal, Zoo Genesis, was the very major type of plant and animal must have evolved not from one another but directly from dirt and water. A. Clark, The New Evolution. Zoo Genesis, page 30, 1930, page 211. The evolutionary world was stunned into silence, for he was an expert. He knew all the reasons why transspecies evolution was impossible. Well, we'll leave it there. Um, all this information, uh, we've got up to page 44. All this information can be found the Evolution Cruncher by Vance Ferrell. Um, and it's a thousand, it, it's a 965 to you and um, I'll try and do some more in the next few days on this topic. So I hope it's informative to you. All the information I say again was from the Evolution Crunch of Vance and Farrell. Uh, we give you permission to use the material and to spread the information. And I hope that you found uh, all the information a help. Uh, if you go to evolution-facts.org, um, evolution-facts.org, uh, Evolution Cruncher by Vance Farrell, BAMA, published by Evolution Facts, Incorporated, Box 300, Altamont, TN 37301, USA. Uh, so this is um, Vance Farrell's text. Take care now and God bless.